Um, so basically, uh, this presentation I did at the Cap Lab uh, version of this down at the last ICE conference, and kind of what my um, rationale for exposing people to this is that a lot of my counterparts that I work with um, absolutely despise working on Cat Lab and interventional and any of the of those modalities. And I, you know, I was kind of trying to figure out what what might cause that, whether it be a lack of knowledge, or maybe they didn't work on it and really hated it, or, or whatever. So, I'm kind of a, my intention is to kind of expose it to the world. It, it is kind of a, a secretive um, part of the, the business. Um, they, they kind of tend to be a, a like a hermit type crowd that if you're not one of them, then they don't want anything to do with you. And then also, people generally don't reach out to, to find out more about it. So. Like I said, I'm just going to kind of pull back the, the curtain and show some of the behind the scenes and some of the uh, details of it. Um, I kind of went a little different this year, so um, if you have any kind of IR background, um, this, this may take a little different path than, than what you might expect it to. But I did that on purpose because the, the topic is so encompassing. Um, it's really hard to do. It just has been, you know, a little over an hour's worth of presentation time. So, um, like I said, you may see some obvious things in art there, but hopefully I'll have some things that you may not be aware of and that would be uh, kind of interesting or revealing about the um, business. So let's get started. Okay, so basically the whole kind of thing started back in the 1950s. So um, back then there was no cath lab, there was no intervention, so there was no vascular, there was no neuro type systems like this out there. So all this was brand new, and you had several different people, different groups, kind of doing the same thing at the same time, but all kind of having the same goal as to be able to access parts of the body without having to do conventional surgery. So what started out was they had floor systems and they started using flexible catheters um, to access parts of the body to see what they could find out. And most of it was, in these days, was kind of experimental. It's like, are we able to access, you know, the heart, the brain, you know, the uh, peripheral arteries and, and other vessels and organs um, using this. So it was kind of the Wild West. And, Everyone was just kind of learning how this all worked. <clears throat> so here we have an early lab. Well, we'll just call it that since it doesn't have a specific program. <laughs> and so um, some of the things that you might notice that's similar to the ones we have now is, well, here we have an image receptor, which in this case is an uh, image intensifier. Um, and then we also have a monitor. And I'd have to laugh if you had an interventionalist have to use this site's monitor today, how uh, full cavity it might be. Um, some things that aren't as obvious due to the technology is right up here, this uh, kind of black thing, it's hard to see on the picture. This is a city dome camera. And so we didn't have road mapping, we didn't have reference, we had city film. And so basically it's a motion picture camera with motion picture film in it. And so as the um, procedure went on, they would film the output of the guy. So in an in upcoming site, I'll show you how that got processed in, in review. So this is here with your reference and your roadmap of the time. Another thing that's kind of interesting to see is all the kind of uh, special wiring and, and modifications they did to this. Again, I don't think go show or show information on probably. <laughs> Um, sanction any of that, but again, this, this is in the very beginning, so it's kind of a um, you know, learn as you go thing. Uh, this came out about um, probably the late 1950s, to give you a time reference. Yeah. <laughs> you get to see a preview of those guys. So basically what it uses, the, the first component of it was it uses fluoroscopy. So fluoroscopy um, allows you to get real-time moving images of inside your image. Now the early systems were just pure fluoroscopy, so there was no you know, 
um, you know, go back and look at it again. It was live, it was real time, and it was done. So you had to use the Sydney um, camera to go back and look at previous images. Um, normally, you get on a video monitor, and um, so it's um, both useful for the diagnostic and interventional procedures. Back in those days, it was mostly diagnostic, but I think they were making attempts at also doing interventional type cases with them. So if you haven't seen one here, it's basically a catheter. Um, this one would be um, ran through your femoral artery, and then the, the long flexible part, and then you can see the, the guide in the front um, would then go up your leg and then up into your wherever part of the body that they're um, examining. So here's our latest and greatest at least possible I work in um, IR system. It's a uh, semen psychotic. Um, I really haven't gotten to know a lot about it. Right now it's only um, in the uh, bipedal version. So this kind of gives you an idea of what the uh, latest and greatest looks like as far as technology. Um, the hospital I work at is a problem center, so we get a lot of hits and um, like facts and, and um, accidents like that. That's for the procedure. So, um, as, like I said, everyone was kind of trying to find their way to figure out what to do with this new technology and these new procedures. Uh, one of the first and, um, things they were able to kind of do was uh, using them for vascular procedures. So for those of you not in the business, vascular is everything really outside of the heart. So you can think of cardiac as being your, your just centered with your heart, and then vascular is pretty much all the way from your head to your toe. Toes. Hopefully, you have more than one toe. <laughs> but they have a way to fix that. Okay, so here is basically you know nutshell what a vascular procedure does. So say this is one of your um, arteries in your like leg or extremities. So what will happen over time is you'll have that you know. Uh, Supreme pizza or double cheeseburger or whatever of that, you know, you throw my dinner and it's quite, quite tasty and enjoyable. <laughs> um, so at the time, your, your arteries grow flat, you know, and they will start narrowing and then cutting off your blood flow. So what they'll do so is um, put in the catheter um, with the diagnostic portion of it, find out where this blockage is, and say, okay, wow, we got a you know, what percentage uh, occlusion here. So then with, on another catheter, they'll come in, and there'll be a balloon catheter, and they'll come in there, and they'll um, open up the balloon, and uh, let the blood flow um, will cover the, some of the other interventional procedures there. So in a nutshell, basically, they're taking an occluded um, vessel and opening it up so that it can uh, resume uh, having a more normal flow of uh, blood. So uh, here's a, just, I mean, just a handful of different types of catheters. Um, if you ever go into IR or, or cath lab, I mean, they got hundreds of different catheters, different sizes, different flavors, et cetera, et cetera. One thing to keep in mind with this, so we're, we're, right, we're still in the early days, so we're on the cutting edge of technology and medical science, and we got all this equipment and all these ideas of, wow, what we can do while we're inside the body. Who made the first catheters? So that, that's kind of a you know, chicken and egg kind of not. So in, in doing this presentation, I learned that the early radiologists would make their own catheters. They would get um, radio antennas, and they'd go down to the hospital maintenance shop or in their garage, and they would make their own type of catheter based on what they thought it needed to do. And they actually had conferences in the early days where they'd get together and share their, their ideas and their tips of, hey, you know, maybe if you do it this way, then you can get to this vessel. Or so before they were catheters, they, they had radio antennas. So, uh, a little, little tidbit, like I said, you walk into these labs and you're just going, like, well, you're going to think about where did the catheters come from? And that was the origin of those um, catheters. Oh. 
Okay. Um, so here's a little more involved um, showing uh, the vascular um, uh, opening things up. So here we have the balloon. This would be a, a stent balloon. And um, the stent being over the, over the top of it, they, they figure out where through the road mapping where that was, come you know, back with this. Then they inflate the, the balloon and um, push the stent into the uh, artery or the vessels on the walls. And then they deflate the balloon and then leave the um, stent. And eventually the, the tissue will grow around the stent and, you know, um, supposedly as strong as it was before, not even stronger. So, um, one area that again kind of a lot of bounce from your traditional, you know, what we're missing something here. Yeah, you know. Um, hang on a second. I think we got a addition put in. Again, those technical details. Sorry about that. Um, unfortunately, I had um, more than one version of this. Okay, oh, there we go. Okay, here we go. Um, yeah, which I think I think right more credit to do. Um, so the, the person that came up with what we consider um, modern um, interventional radiology was Dr. Charles Dunn. Uh, his story was that he was physician, uh, they had a 82 year old woman that had a, a foot that had gangrene on it. And um, basically, it was to the point where they were, you know, basically their only choice was to amputate it. So he came up with an idea with all this crazy idea of putting catheters into different places of the body. That maybe if he were to put a catheter in her leg and see if there was some kind of blockage as to why the foot wasn't getting any blood, then maybe they could save her foot. So he um, he tried the procedure and did find a clogged artery, opened up the artery, and where they were able to save her foot, and she was able to walk on both feet until she passed away. So that was kind of the like first successful interventional type radiology exam or uh, intervention that was performed on the patient. So here's uh, Dr. Dyer with his uh, team uh, doing uh, some, some kind of a uh, medical deal. And um, that would have been about 1964 when they were able to do that. So it was a little bit later after when they kind of first started experimenting with things, but um, that he was kind of a credit to uh, being able to do a successful one. Uh, so we'll go over some of the early technology um, that led up to this. Um, this would be a, a lab from, from the late 1960s, basically to, to look at them 
other than the type of procedure they're doing, they're, they're very similar to each other. So um, this one is more like a, what we would probably look at as the RNF room. So it didn't have the traditional C or like um, you know layout that we, we traditionally associate with interventional or CAF. So one of the first um, technologies that they used, including in that first picture we saw, is an uh, image intensifier. Uh, this is off of a um, interventional lab from the uh, mid 2000s. Um, so here you have the where the um, X-rays after the excitation come up into the um, cathode of the the image, where the signal is then turned into an electronic signal and then sent up through the bell. Um, up here is the big um, camera that records the images and then sends them off to an image processor and then that's what puts it up on all the monitors and as well as recorded, records it. So that's the technology, and this is the current technology that we use now is a digital detector. And surprisingly, it works real similar to the image intensifier, and it's digital as opposed to an analog uh, system. It does the same thing, it converts the uh, radiation in, into light, which gets converted into an electronic signal similar to an image processor, and then um, both recorded and uh, displayed. And this just happens in like milliseconds. I mean, it's instantaneous. So uh, it's very fast and it's basically real time for all intensive purposes. So, getting back to the timing stuff, here's what the old systems um, look at probably were looking maybe like mid 60s, could have um, had used um, as their technology. So, here is the bell for the image intensifier. Over here, you have a, a mirror, and then you have a uh, television camera, which I'll uh, show you here in a second. On this side, um, you have another mirror, and down here, you have that city camera that I was telling you about. So this is like a motion picture camera. So this films the output of the AI, and what will happen then is, um, once they use up their supply of film, you can take it out, there's a special film processor, that they put the film in, it processes the film, and then within the room, there's a viewer, which we'll get on later. Then they reload it, um, then proceed on with their procedure. So the old um, cases would have taken a lot longer than the ones that we do now in terms of you know, having to work with the technology. So this um, lab is from the 1970s. And so some interesting things to point out here. So right here you have the, the image intensifier that I see set. And here's that city camera that's recording the output of the eye. You have a C arm here, and then down behind them is the, the, the X ray tube. Now here's that, um, and then we also have some good old CRT monitors that those of you who have to change those, you know, <laughs> and those are the uh, muscle lock those uh, stands. Um, well, it's interesting though that this is an overhead system. So the system actually was off of the floor and able to move, you know, probably do the same type of movements that our current ones do. So that's not really bad for 1979, at least in my opinion. Um, so here's where um, the doctors would review their, their films. So they have to rope map anything or review um, their images. They have to sit down and then you take the city film and then spool it um, up onto the viewer. And then they sit there, there's a, a foot pedal down here. They can press the foot pedal and go you know, forwards, backwards, depending on how they want to review it. Once they got an idea of what they wanted to do, then they go back and they start doing the procedure again. Um, I actually had to, in my early biomed days, uh, work these for the dogs because they are very temperamental. And I would get a call from the lead up in the cat lab, and they like, you know, you need to get up for Dr. So and so wants to look at his films. And I'd be like, those films are like 20 years old. You can't be serious. He goes, no, Dr. So and so wants to look at his films. And so, and make sure Dr. Soso can review his films before he you know, went in and did his case. So, um, it, you know, 
Do they digitize them in microfish or somewhere? Or oh, or they just, they just really, the films were so old that the you know, heart had changed. I mean, so much that they weren't of any clinical value. But they, we had a couple old timers that insisted that they be able to look at their films from 1989. Yeah. So it looks like they're having some kind of open, grand opening celebration or, or something. But you gotta have the cake. <laughs> yeah, gotta have the cake. <laughs> Okay, so in this vintage of, of lab as well as um, the older ones, you would have had a pickup tube. Basically, a pickup tube is an old video camera that they you would have used back in the day when you would have seen the TV um, crew show up and their cameras like this big and it's on a big, you know, wheel and yeah. Um, the radiologists want to admit it, but I know the PAs would be um, still have a couple of systems with pickup tubes in them, and the image quality is actually better with two of these old timers than they are with, with the um, replacement for um, the only bad parts they take are they kind of warm up and they're very temperamental. So when they work good, they're really good, and when they don't work, then they're, yeah, <laughs> no fun. Then here's a, a pickup tube. This would be the uh, cathode, and then this would be your anode, your output, and um, active system. The other nice thing about those old pickup tubes is they typically gave you a warning when they were going to die. Yeah. They would start doing intermittent stuff or uh -huh. other stuff. Just stop. Yeah, especially the, the circle of death. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can see the circle of death, and you know they were going to be uh, changing them. So here's an old legacy advantage system that uses a pickup tube for its its camera. And like I said, the PAs um, up until they got the new digital system actually like this room better than the uh, um, next generation after it. So the next um, advancement of the pickup tube was solid state CCD camera, which stands for charge coupled device. And basically, it's a big solid state on um, um, camera. Uh, here's the uh, input to it. Um, so the solid state is really stable, um, pretty durable, and rarely have to change them. And um, they're almost written instantaneously, so you don't have any lag. You don't have to let it warm up. You don't have to talk nice to it. It just makes an image. But um, it, it does make this pretty good an image. Just give a pickup tube stick. And here's the, the uh, vintage technology that we use with CCD. So even the CRs, yeah, like 9900, still use the CCD cameras. But this big box that they don't hear um, has the CCD camera. And again, you know, this is probably about 2005, 2007 vintage. So you have the old funky CRT still there. Um, you have the analog II. Um, but for the most part, I mean, they, the, the, the system itself, I, I can vouch for it, was, was a very reliable system. It almost never broke. Um, so, even though it had the technology, it was a sweet part to, to keep going. You see a great one. I think I'm one class mm -hmm. right there. Yeah, yeah, well, that's the, the, our, the monitoring system that was in for the extra part. So, I didn't, I didn't work on that very often. I always had to replace the big old funky. You know, they, I think they were like 65, 70 pounds a piece. Yeah. And then, of course, you had to get up on something because they were on that suspension. Yeah, it was, it was entertaining. I don't hit that part, but I think it was the rope. Um, I guess it's a pretty big little problem. Okay, so digital detector. So, like I said, here in the virtual site. We, our current technology is digital detectors. Now, here's the inside, in case anyone hasn't seen what the inside of one of those looks like. This is a GE system, but that's kind of the top of the peak box. 
Um, this one suffered a really horrible um, electrical malfunction and took out all kinds of systems downstream. So we were concerned that the pizza box was one of them, uh, but fortunately it, it broke through the um, catastrophic electrical failure. Excellent. So um, yesterday, for those who were at Todd's um, class where he went over the servicing of interventional cat lab, he was talking about an inbreed, which is um, what is um, allows it to have the pulse floral. So he was uh, kind of not as impressed with the Phillips version in that this was internal to the tube. So this one now maybe a replaceable tube. This cell I'll show you on the next slide sits into the uh, cathode um, high voltage um, part that just drops in and then the high voltage cable that connects on the back of this. So this is what allows you to give you your frame rate for your floral. So as you're making your um, run, then this will pulse at a, at a rate that the uh, detector can then keep, keep in um, line with and it makes for a really nice picture. Also reduces the uh, radiation to the patient but it's not on the entire time. It's only pulsing at that frame rate to uh, make the image. Um, so another big thing here is the uh, collimator. So the collimator takes a big chunk of the um, tube housing, and then down here is the actual X-ray tube. I believe this is an MX160. And here's it kind of out, out of the wide one. Um, so the input plugs into right here into the uh, cathode negative side of the tube, and it goes in just like a um, stick would. And then it's got to bring the type down over the port so that it's um, got its electrical isolation. Here's the window to the tube, so the collimator sits here. And then um, over here is your um, part of your cooling system for the um, tube because it uses a, a tube cooler or tube chiller. Okay, so next thing, a um, big part of interventional radiology is, of course, the use of injectors. This is a, um, I guess, now Banner um, Mark 7. So as a result of the uh, injectors, what the injector does is send in an iodine contrast at the very much event with a digital subtractive run. So what they'll do is they'll set up a table and um, have it, the patient ready to go. They'll inject the um, contrast in it at, a, at a designated time, and the contrast will then be at the spot that they need to um, image. And then they're able to take the table and run it down the length of the um, x ray, actually run the x ray down the length of the table, and then do a uh, subtractive image. Now, this unfortunately does a really horrible job of showing exactly what that means. You need to have like a moving image to really do it justice, but basically, here's your before image, and so you have a lot of glory and, and like anatomy and other structures kind of in the way. And this is the digital subtractive image. You can see the catheter and then into what vessel it is. I'm assuming it's going towards the heart. Um, and you can your lungs right here, which is fine for it. So basically, what the digital subtraction does is it's almost like a CT. It cuts through and slices and then it, it cleans up your image so you can focus on the area that you're actually interested in. Okay, so IRCT. So um, I never knew up until here recently that I uh, started working on CTMR that there was such a thing. So um, I've always been in the lab, so I've never seen them do a procedure in CT, but now one of the systems I take care of is a dedicated IRCT system. A so person that piqued my curiosity, well, what exactly do they, what do they do with a, a CT scanner in IR? And, yes, so looks just like every other kind of CT scanner. Or fact, they use it as their overflow system when IR is not using it. So it's got everything that you know you could need for any kind of CT scan. 
So basically what they do is they use it for a guided biopsy. So the notification in there, they'll do the CT scans, and then they'll, they'll put in the needle to do a biopsy. As they put the needle into the, to the body, they'll use the CT to help guide it to make sure that they hit the right spot where they want to go. Um, get their biopsy on them. So yeah, like I just said, it scans a uh, needle into the lesion to um, obtain a tissue sample. And here's a shot of it. I believe that this part here is where they're, they're trying to access whatever part of the body that they're looking for. That the, um, this kind of has that artifact look that well, the CT image is for a foreign object. So that's, I'm guessing that I didn't have any guidance as far as the picture itself will have been. And here's the inner workings of the IPCT. Um, this guy bust his uh, heat exchanger. And so that's this big dude right here. So this heat exchanger quit working and um, the uh, oil to the um, x ray tube. So if you haven't seen the inside of the, the CT scan, that's what that is. And it um, does do like places as well. Now, here's where I kind of went off, off the road with my, I don't know, uh, scope or focus on the topic. So, a lot of people would consider an ERCP as necessarily a traditional, um, traditional radiology, but it does fit with under the umbrella. Um, it, basically, what it is, um, we'll cover in a second, I'm not going to say that, it's all the last word. But basically, it's a uh, yeah, liver, pancreas, you know, examination. And they use it, they go through the patient's um, mouth and esophagus to go down through the upper GI tract. So we'll just call it ERCP. Now, this was a, a dedicated ERCP room that I actually took care of. This was up in the GI lab. This is part of supposed to be in radiology. Um, they would bring in the patient, they'd have anesthesia. And um, a bunch of other support people in there to do to, to do these cases. So um, basically, what they do is they go in with the scope, they go down the patient's esophagus, down past the stomach, and then they get into the outside of the common uh, biliary duct. Um, what they're looking for basically is any kind of obstruction normally caused by gallstones. If the gallbladder is inflamed or has issues, the a lot of times they're able to just fish the gallstone or gallstones out of there. They don't have to go and do a lot of coli, but chances are they're going to be bad. So that's only a, a temporary solution, but at least that's give them some relief so they can get their bile flowing again and they'll feel better. And here's a close up of it. So they're able to get down in there. They have like a little thing that comes up there and then they're able to get a hold of the gallstone that's blocking the bile ducts. It's like here's a very painful. Um, they can get in there and pull out that gallstone and then get that um, flowing again. Now for a more interventional um, type of approach to doing that, now of course through this procedure they can't fish out gallstones, but there are other structures that happen within the bile ducts. And this is, um, again, a percutaneous trans cavity, and I'm not even going to try to say it. So basically what they do is they use a traditional interventional lab. They will use a biopsy needle that will go down through the body and then go into the biliary duct, and then they will then use the um, biopsy um, set up to try and clear any obstructions. Um, unfortunately, what this is a probably good indicator is that the patient has cancer and the part of the tumor is actually blocking the duct, not like a gallstone. But any kind of relief like this is, you know, better than none. System, again, kind of outside of what a lot of people consider being the typical interventional type of setting, but it is still interventional and still does use coral. So basically, a cysto room is where they go in and they will go and um, check your urinary tract um, for any problems, your kidneys, your bladder, um, your, your readers, etc. So there's kind of a diagram of the area that a cysto room would 
Yeah. So one of the, the common things that I'll see um, being done in Cisco is either some kind of blockage, just say my quick stints in there if the reader um, has collapsed or is narrowed, or in this case, um, kidney stones. So a lot of times patients either have kidney stones stuck or it's unable to pass it themselves, and then they'll go up there with various means to all look painful um, and, and break up that stone and then let it open up the ear again so that that all starts flowing down. Um, a lot of places now are going away from a traditional system road. Um, they the real estate's too too much, and so they've gone to now using CRs with uh, radiolucent tables. So they can use a CR for other cases. They can just roll the radiolucent table out of the room and use that for water room for any number of other cases. So this is kind of the wave of the future, but you know, having a dedicated um, system room is kind of a thing in the past or is becoming so make sure that back is needs a back to head otherwise. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's not fumes or yeah no system. definitely yeah no we we would very gently try to remind the the uh, text the shillings <laughs> bag before you put it in the room. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. Sorry. That's Okay, um, so one of the, again, non-traditional areas that they are using um, interventional radiology in is interventional oncology. Um, I just had recently had a co-worker that went in, he had a, a tumor on his liver, and um, I was kind of surprised he took the IR, IR lab instead of like radiation oncology or some kind of traditional cancer treatment area. So there's some different types of um, oncology um, procedures they can do in the IR lab. Um, one is image guided ablation. So instead of like the EP lab where you ablate the SA or the AB node or some bad things, they can actually go in and try if the tumor is small enough, they can actually ablate it and kill the cancer cells right inside the um, area that it's at. Um, the next one is trans arterial embolization. Um, basically what they do is they'll go in and they'll um, use different types of compounds and they will block the blood vessel that's feeding the tumor area and they'll actually starve the tumor. So you don't have to go in there and do an invasive procedure and try and cut it out or use chemotherapy. Um, I believe this is the technique that they used on, on my coworker that they went in and put in some kind of a, a block on the blood vessel, starved it, he then took external chemotherapy, and then so far, um, it looks like the results have been very good. So um, what happens to the tumor? It just stays there? What's that? What happens to the tumor? Uh, eventually, it just, just, just shrivels up the other way. The bottom of the body, I'm sure. Yeah, it's just kind of like it cuts it off, it dries up, and then hopefully the body just passes it out like it with any other dead tissue. Mm -hmm. Um, another one is uh, transarterial chemoembolization. So basically the same idea of what you do is you put something in there to starve or block the blood flow to the tumor, and then you put in an another pellet that releases um, a small amount of chemotherapy um, into that area, so it pulls it in and starts it off, and it gives it a, a double um, shot at the tumor. And then the, the next one is uh, selective internal radiation therapy. So basically, this is um, like taking a radioactive salt that you might use in like um, nuclear medicine, probably a little more intense, and it's uh, sealed up in a capsule. Then you plant that into the tumor, and then eventually that the radiation in that um, little capsule then kills that part of that tissue and hopefully takes out the tumor with it.
If you want to complain to management, I'm, I'm all for it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh well, thank you. I appreciate it. So we're on the on the home stretch. So, um, won't be too much longer. So one of the new areas that um has come out, I want to say the past almost like ten years or so is hybrid ORs. Now, kind of like the early days with this, you know, idea of using catheters and interventional procedures, hybrid ORs kind of the Wild West. Some hospitals use them purely for cardiac, some use them for vascular, some use them for IR, some use them for all of the above, depending on their needs. And so we'll cover the advantages of using a hybrid OR versus a traditional interventional lab. Yeah, oh, you know what? I might just do that while I'm uh, while I'm here. You... There's. <laughs> okay, I can do it for you. Oh, no, this is cool. Yeah, we're good. Thanks. Oh, no, I'm good. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so, <laughs> so, here's a robot. Yeah. yeah, I think it'll be all right. So, here's a hybrid OR. Um, this is a robotic uh, artist, or it's a Zigo. So it's got an auto industry robot on the back, and then it's got a traditional um, C arm on the front, and um, it's in the actual OR. So one of the advantages of um, that's my um, girly hand next to the the robot knuckle. That little um, triangle part on the top says warning pinch zone. <laughs> you know, it's more like lose your limb zone, but I guess the Germans didn't want to, you know, get Scary people too excited. Right? Yeah. So one of the advantages of having a procedure done in the OR is, especially like with something with the AAA, um, is if things go bad and you can't fix it uh, intervascularly, then you have the option of opening them up and, and fixing it through traditional surgery surgery means i mean you could try and do this in a in a lab and then it with hopes that you could get them to the or quick enough but what's nice is it has the anesthesia there you have all the people ready to go and it's already in an or environment so um for doing um big procedures like a triple a it, it makes sense to do them in a hybrid or setting than do, trying to do them in a traditional lab if you have that option so basically what a AAA is, is an aneurysm uh, down in the lower ascending um, aorta. And uh, normally happens um, in men um, over the age of 50 and um, our smokers tend to be the number one um, victims of uh, AAAs. Um, if you have a AAA, um, Fortunately, the, the survival rate's much better than it was years ago, um, but it's, it's still a very scary um, thing to have to deal with. So hopefully they'll catch it before it um, becomes this. Yeah, yeah, so they'll, they'll do like what a lot of times for men over the age of 50, they'll do an ultrasound and then scan that area and make sure that your lower um, aorta isn't you know, distended it and yeah, have issues. Another type of um, thing that they'll do um, as far as vascular repair or, or interventional repair is uh, endo endovascular aneurysm repair. And that's just farther down on the uh, anatomy. So it's below the aorta and it's above where your femoral arteries branch off and um, go down your legs. So basically a lot of it, if you think of it, it's just a, a simple vascular repair, except the um, stent on it's about that long and about that big around. So they're, they're huge. 
Um, so it's just a bigger version of what they would do in the coronary arteries or um, inside any other vascular um, cavities. It's just a, a larger area. And then there's the back side of my little robot friend. <laughs> okay, so not this last weekend, but the weekend previous, so two weekends ago, I was on call and I got called in. So this is kind of my own special IR story the end the, the day on. So um, the um, uh, team got called in on a Sunday and um, showed up and they, you know, just fired up the system like they always do and they started getting ready to prep. Uh, they walked in the room and the room was just covered in ceiling tile and water and all kinds of fun stuff. So what had happened is the roof above, um, we had had a fairly, fairly good snow and it was finally melting and, and running off and it came down through the roof and into the um, IR lab. Now, one thing that they did, which I didn't really particularly appreciate, they, they left the room on. So by the time I got there several hours later, because they went ahead and did their case, and then, then they called um, to let, let us know about it. Yeah, so they left the room on. And so I come in, and everything's powered on. And I, I go over, and I look at the monitor, and I'm going like, between water and electricity? <laughs> Don't know. I guess they, they, they know they're clinical. So I, I come up to the, the large screen monitor and it's it's kind of glowing. It's got a little bit of glow to it and I go, oh, that can't be good. So I go over to the back. I flick the power on and flick it on or off and on. And yeah, that's that's what I got. And so I ran I ran my hand down under the um, base of it where the, where the vents are to cool it. And my, my hand had this kind of gooey wet. wet stuff coming off of it. And I was going like, yeah, this thing's gone. And um, the the IR manager finally showed up and he laughed. And he said, yeah, they said it, it, it hung on there for a while. It was, you know, on and had numbers on it. And then they came back later and it was like this. And I'm like, oh. mm -hmm. yeah. all right. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's about a ninety hundred thousand uh, dollar item right there, and then uh, my my final um, part of my journey in this. So I thought, well, what the heck? Since they had already left the room on, and um, I thought, well, let's just see what it will do. So I went in and I put it in an REO just to see if the gantry would would do its thing. Well, when I put it in the REO. I had water literally shooting out the side of the detector, coming out below the collimator, and then out of the tube housing. And at that point, I said, you know what? I think we're done. And so I went in, and I killed the 480 and killed the UPS and then sent my boss a very detailed email saying that, yeah, I think this is the la it's its last day. You didn't get that. Dryer. Yeah. So, uh, so, so that was my 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 special IR story to share. Um, of course, um, you know, radiation safety. You always want to keep your time to minimum uh, distance as far as you can, and then always use shielding if possible.